Thank you for listening to this recording of Family Bible Church's Sunday morning message. We pray that God will use this word to bless and encourage you. So over the last five weeks, we've taken a, a little hiatus from our study on the book of Matthew to look at a mini-series on prayer, the importance of prayer in the life of the individual and of that of the assembly. Um, today is the sixth and final week of that series, but what's kind of fun is, as I went and I planned this, it wasn't in my, my planning originally. I saw it just as a, a break, and we were going to come back to Matthew. But then as I was looking forward to the, the series on prayer, and I was looking at the last one being on the power of prayer, I realized then the next passage that it, where I was going to go was actually the next passage of Matthew. And so they blended together. So you can see kind of the, the, the splash screen is a, is a blend of the two series because actually that's what today is then. It's actually, I've, I've filed this both under my, in my, my folder of Matthew and I filed it in my folder for prayer series in 2019. And so it's kind of fun because it's all one and the same. And so it all depends on which series you go through. You'll wind up seeing that as far as the messages and that kind of stuff online. And... Um, but as a way of reminder then, since we're kind of sliding back into the, the series on Matthew as well as continuing our series on, on prayer, um, I had um, Gerald read all the way from the beginning of chapter 17 because it's important for us to understand the context of what's going on um, when Jesus is coming down and he's going to be t- healing this um, quote-unquote epileptic boy. We'll talk about that in a moment. Now, we know from the book, uh, Luke 9, I believe it is, Luke's um, um, writing of this, that he includes a little detail that this is on the next day. So they were only up on the mountain for one day, okay? That was an important little thing for me. It may not be a matter for you, but I just thought it was interesting, you know, how many days were they up there? Were they up there 40 days? Were they up there three days? How long were they with Jesus on the mountain? But they were there just one day. It was happened on the next day that they, when they had come down from the mountain, that these things occurred. And so while they were on that mountain, they had that mountaintop experience, right? They were there, and while they were up there, they had the privilege of seeing Jesus with Moses and Elijah. Now, we know from, I think it's Mark's writings, that, um, that Peter and, and James and John actually fell down like they were asleep while they were up there. And so that Jesus actually kind of woke them up, and that's when they saw what was going on. I find it very interesting, just a little thought process as we get into this series, and we talk about this, or this message today, and we think about Luke 22 as well, when Jesus tells them to, to, to pray so you don't fall into temptation that the disciples continually, every time they're there, they're, they're doing what? They're sleeping. Does it sound, I mean, am I stepping on toes yet? I'm not trying to step on toes, but you get it? We'd rather stay in bed than what? Stay on our knees. And so, so they come down then. They have this mountaintop experience. They see the glory of Jesus, right? They come down from the mountain, okay? And then we run into then to this situation that they're coming into. Now, Today we're going to talk about the power of prayer, and so I forgot, I had some slides here, so I'm going to slide through there. This is the, again, the, where they're at, up by Mount Hermon, okay? So that's where the, this occasion is going to take place. But we have this situation um, where, that's coming about, and so they come down from the mountain, and again, you've got to, when we, when we started into this series on, on, on Matthew, we're looking at focusing on the Messiah, and, and I shared a statement at the beginning of each of these messages, and that is that, and it's not on your sermon note sheet, so we'll see whether you remember this, and that is Matthew was a what? A Jewish man writing to Jewish people about a Jewish Messiah, okay? And so unless you fully comprehend the Jewishness of this writing, you don't, you don't get a lot of what's being stated, okay? So it's important to understand the Jewish background, the Jewish context of this. So, <clears throat> So, major Jewish moment up on top of that mountain, okay? They saw Moses and Elijah, the two greatest prophets. Potentially, the two witnesses from Revelation chapter 11, okay? I'm not telling you that's who they are. There's a potential in my mind that it could be um, Elijah and Enoch, um, because neither one of those two guys are recorded as dying. But there's a lot of indications that it potentially is Elijah and Moses who will be the two witnesses (laughs) at the temple um, for those first three and a half years of the final week of Daniel's vision, okay? That's just a little free thing thrown in there, okay? 
But we've got this big Jewish moment that happens to these three guys, okay? They come from down from the, the, the mountain, okay? And they come into this area. Remember, they're in the region of what? Does anybody remember? Remember what region they're in? Caesarea Philippi, okay? Do you remember what else it was called? What's it known for? Caesarea Philippi, what else was it known for? It was also called Banias, okay, later on. But prior to Caesarea Philippi, it was called Pania, okay? But it was named after, you're good, Pan, the, the Greek god Pan, who was the, the god of the wild and of wild things, and so we want to become the fertility god, okay, if you would. And so they're in this very pagan, very pagan area, which there are Jewish people involved in it, but it's a very... So Jesus intended to go there, and remember, before he goes up on the mountain, he turns around and he asks his disciples an important question. Does anybody remember that question he asked them before he went up on the mountain? Who do men say that I am? And so they said, well, some say you're John the Baptist, some say you're Elijah, some say you're da-da-da, some say, you know, whatever, okay? And then he turned to them, he says, but who do you say that I am? And so that's when Peter says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. That's right, you're the Messiah, okay? He recognizes the Mashiach in his presence, and he says, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God, okay? Which is important, because he was the what God? The living God. Apart from all these other gods that that area represented. Make sense? He's in an area that was devoted to all these false gods. Jesus intentionally took them up there for this moment, right? So they come down from the mountain. They come from down from the mountain, okay? And what do the four of them, because that's Jesus, Peter, James, and John, what do the four of them see? I want you to think about this, because again, you've got to think from a Jewish perspective. What do they see? They see a crowd, but not a crowd. It's a multitude. It's a, it's a raucous crowd. It's an aklas, okay? And so it's a, it's a motley crew of people, okay? Important because words, we see a crowd, we see a multitude, but literally the Greek word says that they were a, a, a raucous crowd, okay? Go ahead, keep going. Arguing? Arguing? Contending? Contending? Attacking accusing, attacking, okay? They are coming at the other nine disciples or apostles, okay? This is important. You've got a raucous crew. You've got a riot getting ready to happen here, okay? And in Jewish mindset, okay, you've got to understand that someone who declared himself to be a prophet, okay, if they were not able to back it up, what happens to them? They die. How? They were stoning, okay? I think... That what's happening here is you got the preamble of a good stoning. Okay? Because you got a guy, they're, they're, they're there, right? And they're the disciples of Jesus, right? Who was able to do all these what? Healings. And remember, Jesus had sent these guys out into the highways and the byways, into the cities of Israel, and he gave them power to do what? Cast out demons, Cast out demons and to heal, right? Do all these, yeah, you're good, to do all these wonderful works. And so these same guys had gone out and they have healed people and they have cast out demons. Right? So, dad brings son to Jesus. But Jesus what? He's not here. But it's okay, we're here. Right? And so we're here and he's given us what? He's given us power. He's given us authority. Ah, who needs Jesus when... When I'm here. Now, I know I don't want to read too much into that, but do we do that sometimes? We wouldn't say that, but sometimes we kind of, you know, start looking to ourselves and forget that actually I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And we begin to think, we forget that last part of the phrase, and we say, I can what? I can do all things. I can do all things, man. He's giving me the power, so I can do it. And we forget that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And so they bring this young man to the, the dad brings his, his son, and all of a sudden his, we're not told, because we're not told this part of it until later when the disciples bring this up. Right? So he brings it, and the disciples must have interacted with this, and they weren't able to succeed. They weren't able to heal or cast out. They weren't able to deal with the situation that was there. They fell flat on their faces. And so, in the Jewish mind, they're what? Say again? They're failures, but they're false prophets. Okay? So, there's this contention that's going on now. 
Okay? Jesus just happens to come on the situation. Isn't it kind of neat how God just happens to come on into your situation sometimes? He's kind of kind of hanging out there, watching over. You know, it's kind of like God speaking to Moses, saying, hey man, it's time to get down from the mountain because your people, <laughs> your people are, are, are turning away from me. They've already made themselves an idol. God already knew. He knew what was happening the entire time. Moses was so in his own with God. You know, he doesn't know what's going on down there, but God tells him it's time to go because you need to go take care of the situation. Right? But when Moses is down there, he gets all upset because he sees the people and he does what? He throws the tablets that God had etched out and that God had written on. Wow. You think about that. That's a major... I mean, so judge not less what? You be judged, and with what judgment you judge others. And so they lost their self-control while their leader was up in the mountain. But when the leader came down, he did what? He lost his self-control too. I don't know if you ever thought about that, but that's a little free one too. So anyways, so you have this kind of thing that's going on there, right? So they come down from the mountain, right? They had their mountaintop experience, and they see what's going on. Jesus doesn't what? He doesn't lose his control. That's exactly right. He looks down and he says, hey guys, what's going on? What's happening here, right? From our vernacular. And so the father comes up and says, well, I brought my son who was moonstruck. Okay? And epileptic is what we, how we have has it translated. But literally, it's a lunatic. That's the Greek word. Okay? It's someone who's controlled by the moon. What does that mean? I don't know. Okay? But that's how he described it. It's the best way for him to describe it. It's kind of like, you know, he's, got, he's kind of hanging out with the moon phases here. You know, he's kind of being, being, you know, his highs and his lows with the ebbs and the falls of the, of the tide. And it's just kind of all this. And so this demon, so then he talks about a demon. So he equates then this lunatic thing with having a demon. And that it throws him into the fire. It throws him into the, the water. But he knows, the father knows that the common thread is what? That this thing that's within him is what? What's he say? It's trying to kill him. It's trying to destroy him. Do you know the two words, the Greek word and the Hebrew word that is given to Satan in Revelation? He's called what? In Hebrew? No, no. This, yes, the English destroyer. He's called Abaddon in Hebrew and Apollyon in Greek. Okay, so in the book of Revelation, you read that, whose name is Abaddon and Apollyon. It's kind of an interesting thing, because they both mean the exact same thing, and that is the destroyer. He is the destroyer. That's who Satan is. God is the one who gives life. Satan is the one who seeks to take it away. Make sense? Just a little, again, a little free, a little side note. If you know anybody who's in the uh, um, Masons, okay, and you go to someone who's at, you know, like the 33rd degree Mason or whatever, in the front of their Bible, they have a listing of all the gods, that they, they, they worship and they serve. And they, so they talk about God who goes by these names. Guess what two of the names of their God is? Abaddon and Apollyon. Okay? So you can go check me out on that. So, anyways, always be careful of things that are out there. People who say, oh yeah, we believe in God. Don't just say, oh, okay, that's yeah, great. Find out what God that they're talking about. Okay? And the Jesus, you know, again, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul says, I'm jealous over you with a godly jealousy because someone may come up with another Jesus, another spirit, or another gospel, and you may very well accept them. Not everybody comes in the name of Jesus, not everybody comes, says they have the spirit, and not, not everybody says they're teaching the gospel or teaching you the truth. Okay? So you've got to be discerning and, and, and looking at the spirits. So anyway, so they come down. This whole thing's going on. They're getting ready to, to cast the... Um, cast the, the demons out of the uh, disciples. But anyway, they're ready to destroy the disciples, okay? Because the disciples can't do this, but Jesus says what's going on. So Jesus then comes with the solution, right? And so he says, bring the boy to me. It's very quick, very, very, because you know, we're going to talk about the rest of this in a moment. I mean, this happens pretty quickly. What does Jesus do? He casts the demon out. All right, boom. Cast the demon out. The boy falls down. He gets back up. He's good. Every, and and you know, at the end of the story, life goes on happily ever after, right? Well, it doesn't end there, okay? That's just the, that's just the, the little intro to what really we're going to talk about. That's really what goes on because it's what happens next that's really of great impact. Because now they come alongside. Jesus was able to kind of disperse the crowd at that point because now everybody's kind of like disarmed, you know, like, okay, the kid, yeah, exactly right, Mark. Yeah, oh, shucks, we thought we were going to have a good stoning. And so, you know, 
And so they can't have it anymore, right? And so, so everybody kind of disperses. And Jesus kind of gets his disciples off to the side so he can do a little bit of um, a debriefing, admin stuff. Yeah, a little debriefing going on, you know, kind of you know, talk about, remember the Peter, James, and John, they're not allowed to talk about what's going up on the mountain. So it's good that there was a little diversion that happened when they came down anyway, okay? No one's worried about what happened on the mountain. Now everybody's worried about what almost happened down below, right? And so the disciples, instead of asking, hey, man, what happened up there? Their main question was what? Why couldn't... Say again? Yeah, how did we almost get stoned? Why couldn't we do it? In their mind, I mean, think about it. We thought we had the power. Did we say the wrong words? Now, I know they're not saying that, but that's kind of like us. Like, if we have the right words to God, if we, if we just speak the right words, if we say it the right way, we rub the lamp just the proper way, God's going to do whatever we want Him to do. And so they're kind of, kind of confused. We, we thought we had power. We thought we had authority. And so we just kind of did it, and nothing happened. What happened? The juice run out? I mean, is there, a, is there a power shortage? I loved years ago we were, when I led the retreats up in Canada with the men's retreat. We go 26 miles up even further on a boat, and we get there by train back then. And we get on a boat, and we go 26 miles up river. And we were up in a, um, um, the, the cabin up there. Greg, you were with me, so you remember this, right? And so we were up there for four nights or whatever it was. We came back down. Do you remember? You know what I'm, where I'm going with this one? Power out. You remember the grid? The grid, the, 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 how the power went out years ago? Big, the whole grid on the eastern coast went out, northeast, whatever. It didn't bother us at all. We didn't have any power anyway. We didn't know anything about it. But it bothered a whole lot of people because somebody unplugged the power. And so a whole lot of people couldn't do a whole lot of things because they had no power. The disciples somehow had lost their what? Their power. They lost their power. Think about it from their perspective. Power was gone. They're not thinking that there's a problem with themselves right now. Make sense? They think there's a problem with the system. There's a problem with the situation. Maybe it's a problem with the supply source. So they're trying to find out, why could you do it, but we couldn't. If we missed the, the wrong little process here, and, and I'm, I, I know I'm making a lot of it, but I think it's very important for us, okay? Because there's a, it's a big deal when we come and we consider the power of prayer. There's so many times we think all I have to do is say something, and God has to what? He has to jump and do it. So, Jesus then gives them instructions. And he talks to them about the importance of faith. He says, you couldn't do it because you were of little faith. Remember before Jesus cast out the demon, right? He turned to the crowd, including his disciples, I think, right? And he says what to them? Oh, faithless, perverse generation, how long must I bear with you? How long? This is, this is nuts. How long do I got to be here teaching you the same thing over and over again? And you what? You don't get it. What would you think he would say to the churches today in the United States? If Jesus stood up in the midst of testimony time and started teaching, what would he say to us? How many times? Think about the church of Ephesus. I know your works. I know what you look like. I know the things that you've done. However, I have just one thing against you. But that was a pretty what? Big one thing, wasn't it? You've lost your first love. And if you don't repent... Change the way you think and return from whence you have fallen. He's not talking to the world. He's talking to who? The church. church. If you don't repent and return from whence you have fallen, I'm going to come and remove your candlestick. It's going to be Ichabod written over your doorsteps. That's the first church, but the last church he talks to is who? In Revelation 3, Laodicea. To the church of Laodicea, what does he say to them? You think you are what? Rich. But you're really what? Poor. I wish that you were hot or cold. Now, I'm not going to get into what that means, but it doesn't mean on fire or for, for nothing. It literally, well, I will go into it just so you understand it. Um, Laodicea had no supply of water. They had no source of water. So they got their water from Colossae, and they got their water from Hierapolis. Colossae was known for its fresh, cold springs. So they channeled in the water from, of cold, cold, fresh, cold water from Colossae, 
Hierapolis was known for its spas, its medicinal things, and people went there for that. So they had hot springs, and so they would channel in their water from there. But by the time they got to Laodicea, they were what? Lukewarm. They were good for nothing. Okay, but Colossae was right on the, the place of where all the commerce came through. I'm sorry, not Colossae, but Laodicea was right where all the commerce was. So it was, a, it was an important location. They just had no water. So they aqueducted their water from these two locations. He says, I wish that you were medicinal. I wish you were refreshing. I wish you were either hot or cold. But you're neither one. You're good for nothing. You think you're rich, but you're really poor, and you don't even know it. And then he says to the church, not to the world... Behold, I stand at the door knocking. What door do you think he's knocking? It's not the heart of the unbeliever. We use that for evangelism. It's a great application. But it's not written to the unbeliever. I'm standing here and I'm knocking at the door. I want somebody to open it up so I can come in and have fellowship with you. Who's he talking to? The church. Because we think we got it all. Except that Jesus back then, that was good enough. Now I do everything else on my own. We're good. We use the business practices of the world. We use the business models. We look at what the world does. We follow that. Make sure we have our CEOs and our CFOs and we have our agents. We have our secretaries. We're good. We just move on. It's not the way the body of Christ functions. We do things decently in order. We use the unrighteous mammon of the world. But we don't function like the world because we are not the world. We have a head pastor. And it's not me. I fought on that one. When we put together the Constitution, I do not want to be called the head pastor. I'm not. We have a head pastor. We have a chief shepherd. That's literally the same term. Head pastor, chief shepherd is the same thing. Who's the chief shepherd? Jesus. Jesus. We only have one. And I'm not him. I'm an under-shepherd. I may be an elder, God's, by God's grace, but I'm not, I'm not the big guy. We think like the world. And we've got to change the way we think. Isn't that the whole theme of Matthew? That's what Jesus preached. Change the way you think. Repent. Why? Because the kingdom of God is at hand. So you guys need to change the way you think. Your problem is you got a lack of faith. Faith in the working of God, first of all, is the key to our what? It's the key of our salvation. You have verses there, Colossians chapter 2. Turn with me there. Let's read this real fast. I don't want to skip past it. Colossians chapter 2. Where Paul writes, In him you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the bodies of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, in, in which you also were raised with him through what? Through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. Based upon that passage, and I can go to other passages, okay, you can look at what is salvation? How are you saved? By faith. Just by faith? You're saved by faith. I have faith in, in that rock. I have faith in a tree. No, you're not saved by faith. You're saved by faith in the working of God. Important deal here. Make sense? AA likes to, they, they've gotten so far away from their, their roots, and now they just have, you have, have faith in a what? A higher power. That means nothing. If your higher power is your shoe, what good does that do for you? You know, you have faith in the working of the living God, the one and only true God. Does that make sense? That's what salvation is. It's faith in the working of God, that God did the work. Okay, this is important. Good foundation here, okay? Salvation is, is faith in the working of God. But it's also then not salvation, but when we come to prayer... Our prayer should be then characterized by faith in the what? Working of God. Do you get it? Because again, I can do what? Nothing in and of myself, but I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, because it's going to be Christ who what? Does the work. 
It's God, verse Philippians chapter 2, it is God who works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Actually, I think it's Philippians 1. Philippians 1. It's God who works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. He's the one who does the work. Turn with me to Mark chapter 9. This is Mark's version of what played out here. And it's very important as we transition here. Mark 9, beginning in verse 22, we read about, this is the Father speaking, I want to start at verse 21. Jesus asked the Father, how long is this happening to him? And he said, from childhood. And he, and he said, from childhood. And often he has thrown him in, both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, think about it, this is the Father talking to Jesus. If you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Did you just imagine the moment? Jesus said to him, it's not about me, man. He turns it around and he says, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Immediately, immediately, can I say it again? Immediately, the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help my, my unbelief. He came up to him and said, I originally came to you because I was believing that you could handle this. But now I've been I've experienced your disciples. Pretty sad. Right? And now I'm starting to doubt your power. I'm starting to doubt what you're really able to do. I've got a load of those who say you're who say that they're your followers. Ouch. Should be an ouch. I've seen them, and now I'm just kind of wondering, if you can do anything, ouch. Your life ought to be so reflective of Jesus Christ that there's not a doubt what God can do. But if you can do anything, have compassion, have mercy on us. Jesus turns it around, though, because he knows everybody's what? He knows their heart. He knows where this guy's at. And he says, it's not about me. It's all about you. It's if you can believe, then what? What's he say next? Well, he didn't say that there. What does he tell the man? All things are possible to him who believes. Stop. You are the dad. Do you believe that statement? Do you honestly, in your heart, God knows your heart. Do you believe that all things are possible if you believe in the working of God? Don't just nod the head. I, this is one for you to think about and ponder and to struggle with and go before God on. Because we're all going to say yes. There ain't no doubt in my mind you're all going to say yes. Okay? Because in a sense, that's why we're here. But the question really is, When push comes to shove, do you honestly believe that all things... How many things? All things. I like the donut man when he sings sings this with the kids, you know. How many things? All things. How many things? All things. All things are possible. Yeah, the donut man. Yeah. 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 Here we go. I got got some amens on the donut man. Anyway. Okay. We got interaction. This is cool. Everybody's all for the donut man. Anyways. <laughs> uh, donuts are evil. They cause your body to, to, to die. Anyways, whatever. So, <laughs> but anyways, that's, all, that's only me. So, anyways, but all things are possible. And this is a challenge, not to you. It's really a challenge to me. Again, remember, this is the, I get to play the, the share the wealth card, okay? When God is working on me and slapping me upside the head and all this kind of stuff. So, oh man, you've been saved 30 years. Do you really believe this? How many things I've seen God do. But do I really still believe this? When, when it comes to the point where the next trial comes, the next mountain is there, do I believe that if I had faith the size of a mustard seed, I could say to the mountain, what? Be moved and cast into the sea and it will be done for me? Do I really honestly believe that? Not that God has to do it. But if it's, again, remember last week, if it's according to His will. If it's according to his will, do I believe that, boom, it can happen? 
Or do I instantly doubt what God has? Turn with me to Matthew chapter 17. This is, we see the same statement about the, um, the mustard seed and such, where Jesus says, beginning of verse 7, Matthew 17, beginning of verse 7, But Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise and do not be afraid. And when they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. Now as they came down from the mountain, Jesus commanded them, saying, Tell the vision to no one. Oh, this is actually the passage we're in. I'm sorry. That's not where I'm thinking. Go to Matthew 21. Matthew 21, beginning verse 20. I'm going to start actually in verse 18 for the context. It says, Now in the morning, as he returned to the city, he was hungry. And seeing a fig tree by the road, he came to it and found nothing on it but leaves, and said to it, Let no fruit grow on you ever again. Immediately the fig tree withered away. And when the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, How did the fig tree wither away so soon? So Jesus answered and said to them, Assuredly, I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt... Remember, we talked about that last week, James chapter 1, right? If you, lack, if you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all men liberally. But when he asks, let him ask without doubting, for not, let not that man think that he's going to have anything, because he's a double-minded man. He's like the waves of the sea. God's not going to answer that request, okay? So he says, Assuredly, I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what was done to the fig tree, but you will also, if you say to this mountain, be removed and cast into the sea, it will be done. In whatever things you ask, how? In prayer, how? Believing, you will what? Receive. It's faith in the working of God that is the key to our supplications. Hebrews chapter 6, or 11, we're not going to turn there, but you know Hebrews 11 is the faith hall of fame, right? But in verses 6 to 9, we read about Abraham. And what did Abraham do? He went out not knowing where he was going to go. He just what? Believed in the working of God, that God who called him to go to this place I will show you would what? Show him. And that the same God who said, I will give you, even at 75, at some point, I'm going to give you a what? A child. That that a son, that's exactly right, a son, okay, that he believed that it would happen, even when he had to wait what? 25 years for for that promise to be fulfilled. Abraham went out by faith, and God rewarded that. So we read in verse 6, Without faith it is impossible to please God, for those who come to Him must believe that He exists, and that He is a what? Rewarder of those who what? Diligently seek Him. Diligently seek Him. Don't forget the diligently part, okay? Because we like just to do the the seeking, which means that we can do it when? Casually, on our own. Ah, oh, you know, I'll just seek it here and there, you know. I got a little extra time, I'll seek it now. Okay? It doesn't work that way, okay? So the importance of faith, but then we also read the importance of fasting. This kind only comes out by prayer and fasting. Now, we don't have a lot of time to go over this, but it's important, especially as we go into this week of prayer and fasting, that Jesus, again, makes this as a very important key. Okay, and so passages, we have fasting in the Old Testament and fasting in the New Testament, okay? And so I'm not going to go over all these ones in the Old Testament. You have them on your sheet, okay? So 2 Samuel 12, okay? That's um, the passage where David um, has sinned with Bathsheba. Nathan has come and told him, you are the man. And that part of the punishment, part of the chastisement of his sin was that his baby was going to die. So the, the baby that was born to Bathsheba was going to die. And so we're told then that David did what? He fasted. He fell on his face and he fasted. Okay, And the people then were afraid of what was going on because the baby eventually what? Died. So there's David. He's praying and fasting for seven days, but still the baby what? Dies. Did God answer his prayer? Yes. Yes. What did he say? No. We take it when God says no, that God didn't answer our prayer. God answered the prayer. God said what? No, I already declared the judgment. So this clearly wasn't according to my will. Ouch. God didn't listen to David. Yes, he did. He heard David. And God was hurting. God cares. 
He doesn't rejoice in the death. But this was punishment. David needed to learn an important lesson, and we needed to learn an important lesson through David. This is what God thinks about sin. And that the consequences of your sin aren't easily gotten over. You can't say, oh, but God, forgive me now. Let me make everything right. Psalm 19, David says, keep me from presumptuous sins. Those are sins presuming on the grace of God. You go and do something knowing that 1 John 1, 9, you can come back and say what? I'm sorry, I'm sorry God, please forgive me. And God now has to, according to his will, forgive me. God says there's still consequences. Ezra chapter 10. Ezra mourned for the guilt of those in captivity and he included fasting in it. It was for the guilt of those in captivity. He didn't, he didn't talk about how unjust their captivity was. He didn't talk about how bad circumstance it was. It wasn't God, take us out of this circumstance. Look at what happened. Our enemies did this to us. He actually fasted about the guilt of his people. They were guilty. They were sinners. They deserved it. I want to challenge you to pray and fast for our nation. We're under the wrath of God. And we deserve it. And if we don't repent and we don't respond, it's going to be worse. I'm not a prophet or son of a prophet. But I guarantee you, in my lifetime, if things don't change, this nation is going to go bankrupt. And we're going to look just like Greece and Argentina. And it's not because of total mismanagement of finances. It's because of total mismanagement of our sin with God. When my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves... When they will turn from their wicked ways, when they will humble themselves and call upon my name, I will hear. We want to keep pointing fingers at sinners. Maybe it's the church that needs to start the revival. When we need to be open, and I appreciate that. We need to admit the lusts of our flesh, the lusts of our eyes, the pride of our life. And seek purity and true godly passion. To desire the privilege to share Christ with the world and want his power upon us when it happens. Nehemiah, in chapter 1, fasts when he hears about the condition of Jerusalem, asking for God's intervention. He, he, um, in chapter 9, we read about the congregation fasting uh, on the last day of the tabernacles, because they wanted the presence of God. Esther chapter 4, we read about Esther wanting to go before the, the, she finally relents to go before Artaxerxes, and she says to Mordecai, have the people what? Fast for me three days and three nights, and then I'll go. And whatever happens to me, happens to me. Psalm 35, you can read through all these ones. Psalm 69, Psalm 109, where David is talking about praying and fasting. In Psalm 35, he's talking about praying and fasting for his enemies. Isaiah 58. We'll leave that one. I want to come back to that real quick. Daniel 9, 3 to 19. Daniel is confessing sins and seeking God's mercy. And he's confessing the sins of himself and of his people. But he's fasting and doing it. Luke chapter 2, verse 37. You say, I thought this was Old Testament. Well, it really was because Jesus was just born. So Anna really was an Old Testament saint, if you would. And Anna stayed in the temple fasting, looking to this day that she could see the Redeemer of Israel. And God said, yes, you can do that. I'll, hold, I'll keep you alive for that moment. How cold is that? I yearn to see Jesus' return. Turn with me to Isaiah 58, real quick. Isaiah 58. Such a, such a key passage when we talk about fasting. Isaiah 58, beginning of verse 1. Cry aloud, spare not, lift up your voice like a trumpet. Tell my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. Yet they seek me, how often? Daily. They seek me daily, and they quote-unquote delight to know my ways. Like a nation that did righteousness and did not forsake the ordinance of their God. In other words, they're giving me what? Lip service. They're seeking me daily and delighting to know my will, but they don't do it. 
They ask of me the ordinances of justice. They take delight in approaching God. Verse 3, Why have we fasted, they say, and you have not seen? Why have we afflicted our souls, and you take no notice? In fact, God says, In the day of your fast, you find pleasure and exploit all your laborers. Indeed, you fast for strife and debate, and to strike with the fist of wickedness. You will not fast as you do this day to make your voice heard on high. Is it a fast that I have chosen? A day for a man to afflict his soul? Is it to bow down his head like a bulrush and to spread out sackcloth and ashes? Would you call this a fast in an an acceptable day to Yahweh? Rather, is this not the fast that I have chosen, to loosen the bonds of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free, and that you should break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry, and that you should bring to your house the poor who are cast out? When you see the naked that you cover him, do not hide yourself from your own flesh. Then your light shall break forth like the morning. Your healing shall spring forth speedily, and your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of Yahweh shall be your rear guard." Then you shall call, and Yahweh will answer. You shall cry, and He will say, Here I am. And then He continues on with it. Be careful as we go into this week that you're not using fasting as a manipulation tool of God. God won't be manipulated by you. Fasting is for you to be affliction of your soul, to be brought into the presence of God, and to remember who you are and who He is. And when that all happens, there becomes great power, because again, as we've talked about, then you will receive the desires of your soul. Why? Verse, Psalm 37, verse 4. When will you get the desires of your soul, or your heart? When you delight yourself in the Lord. When you are abasing yourself when you're bringing yourself so down, seeking God's face, all of a sudden His desires become your desires. What He's delighting in becomes your delight. His passions become your passions. And all of a sudden you begin to ask for the same things that God wants. And guess what happens? Power begins to be poured out. I'm thrilled at what I'm seeing in this assembly. It's not to pop you up. This is to glorify God. I'm excited about testimony time today. I was excited last week when I saw what was going on in the church. And I just want to challenge you. This isn't about our church. This is about our God. And what I believe our God wants for this community and for this nation. God doesn't delight in the death of the wicked. Rather, he's long-suffering, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Is that your delight? Is that your passion? Is that your desires? Afflict your soul so that it shall. Fasting in the New Testament, we see that it is actually there as well. I'm not going to go through the passages, but you can go through those in the book of Acts. The importance of fasting in the life of the early church. I want to deal with these principles real quick as we come to the end. The first principle is, fasting is assumed to be part of the life of God's people. In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus says, when you fast. He doesn't say, if you fast. Remember we talked about this when we talked about the Lord's Prayer, quote unquote, the model prayer. He says, when you pray, pray like this, right? Well, right on the heels of that, he says, and when you fast. There is an assumption in God's word that God's people will fast. In fact, he was asked, he says, so um, the disciples of John fast, the Pharisees fast, but your disciples, they don't fast. What's up with this? And what was Jesus' answer? Does anybody remember? That's right. Go ahead. That's right. As long as the bridegroom is with them, why is, there's no need to fast. There's great rejoicing. But the day's going to come when the bridegroom is going to leave, and they will fast. They will fast. Fasting has become a lost discipline of the church. You don't hear it talked about, except for Lent. And so we have 40 days of fasting, which means I'm not going to eat chocolate anymore. 
Or I'm only going to have three cups of coffee instead of four. Or I, I'm, I'm going to give up going to Starbucks. I'm going to go to Dunkin' Donuts instead. What? I'm going to go what? Oh, I'd give up rutabaga any day. That's right. Uh, yeah, hey, oh, yes, I'm giving up green beans. I'm fasting, baby. I'm giving up green beans for Lent. Okay, now I'm not mocking. Okay, I really don't mean to be mocking. Okay? But that's what we think about fasting. That's not fasting. Fasting is, I'm, I'm setting my heart to God. Not to impress God but for God to change me. Again, I think it was a year and a half or two and a half years ago, I preached a message on how to, to, to be all you can be in your, in your Christian walk. And it's by redeeming that which cannot be saved to invest in the redemption of that which can be saved by laying all that I am on the altar that he may alter all that I am. Think about that. You only have so much time, and you can't save it. God tells us to redeem the time, knowing the days are evil, so that we can invest our lives in the lives of others who can be saved. And the only way that's going to happen is when I offer my body, Romans chapter 12, as a living sacrifice, so that I can become conformed to the image of Christ by the work that he's going to do in me. But that's only going to happen when you are willing to lay it out. A fast means nothing compared to killing yourself, to offering yourself as a living sacrifice. I'm not saying actually killing yourself, okay? so don't get me that way. Okay? But literally, sacrificing yourself that God can work through you. Fasting is assumed to be a part of the life of God's people, Fasting, then, is accompanied by, in every one of those things we read through quickly, fasting is accompanied by the true repentance of God's people and a desire for the intervention of God in the affairs of God's people. Fasting is always, always, always true fasting. True fasting. Remember, we read Isaiah 58, right? True fasting is always coupled with repentance. Why? Why? Because you're focusing on who God is. Remember, we talked about this with the praise and then repentance. When you start to focus on who God is and you start to become aware of who you are, you can't help but what? Repent. You're either going to repent or reject. You're either going to repent or rebel. There's no, there's no middle ground. You can't serve two gods. Are you willing to fillet yourself open? not just even with men, but to God. When God has your heart, there won't be an issue with flaying yourself open before men. So in the end, how would Jesus describe your prayer life? Not how will your kids describe it, not how your wife would describe it, but how would Jesus describe your prayer life? What do you believe that God might want to accomplish through you? Do you really believe that all things are possible if you believe? Are you seeking to prepare yourself spiritually in order to meet the challenge? Jesus said to the disciples, you couldn't do this because you hadn't been what? Praying and fasting. This kind only comes by prayer and fasting. Why do we do this twice a year? Why do we have a spring week of prayer and fasting? Why do we have a fall week of prayer and fasting? Because we are in the midst of a spiritual war and we recognize that the closer we get to the day of the Christ's return, that he says that evil will abound. And because it will abound, the love of many is going to wax cold. And he tells us then in Hebrews chapter 10 that we're supposed to gather together and so much more as we see the day approaching that we can provoke one another to love and good works. Why do we do this? Because we're in a war and we want to prepare ourselves for the war. We want to be strengthened for the battle. Because Jesus told us that we're supposed to go out and bash in the gates of hell. Not sit back and enjoy life. Not just be comfortable. And so we have made a decision years ago that we're going to follow 
what Christ has asked us to do, and we want to pray and fast. So that when the trial comes, not if the trial comes, but when the trial comes, that we are prepared by God's grace to meet that trial headlong in a godly way. So in the end, is there a need to change the way you think? Repent. And therefore change the way you act. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your love. I thank you that, Lord, that by faith, by faith in your working, you have said all things are possible to those who believe. Oh, Lord, I remember in your word where it says, I think in Luke, where it says, and when you return, will you find faith on the earth? Lord, what a challenge. Because evil is going to abound. The love of many is going to wax cold. When you come back, will there even be faith found on the earth? Lord, I pray that you would work in this little group of people. I can't answer for everybody else, but Lord, for myself, for my family, for this little group of believers, Lord, that you would work a mighty work in and through us. Lord, I pray that you would help us to be powerfully effective in reaching the lost of our neighborhood, of our community, Lord, of our individual neighborhoods around our houses. Lord, that you would do a powerful, effective work in each of our lives. Lord, that we would set aside continually the things of this world and that we would, we would think on and embrace the things of heaven. Oh God, that we would be such a reflection of you that you would receive the glory by what you do in and through us. In Jesus' name, amen.